At this time, we'll call the March 17, 2023 meeting into order. Anyone willing to give testimony before this board today, please stand and raise your right hand. Hereby affirm the testimony I give today to be the whole truth. Please say I do. I do. Thank you. We need to approve the minutes from the February 17th meeting. Do we have a motion? Motion. We have a motion. Do we have a second? second. <coughs> we have a motion. Mr. Renfro is second by Mr. Ricketts to approve. All those in favor vote aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, our first line of business will be our old business, the Highlands of Poplar Ridge. You ready, Mr. Bashir? Uh, uh, the clearing of the property did not get done by the time we went and did our inspection uh, field review once more. Uh, but we can still recommend approval subject to them getting it cleared by the next step in the process. Uh, this is a preliminary, preliminary plat renewal. Lakeland Utility District does have revised comments uh, that I'll let you read if you wish. Uh, they are still working through uh, getting appropriate request for water service and uh, water and sewer service application <coughs> through their utility district processes. Okay. And I don't know if Eric Brumfield is here with the Utility District. It's the, if he wishes to add anything. Yeah. Eric, do you want to read your comments on this if you don't mind? <coughs> do you have those? I, do. I can read them if you don't. So. Understanding that the original approval of the preliminary plat for phase three of the Highlands Popular Ridge subdivision uh, occurred on July 16, 2020, and that the original approval has now expired. It's the district's further understanding that the preliminary plat that is now being considered by uh, WCPC reflects no changes from the original, uh, original preliminary plat that was approved two and a half years ago. Uh, while the district has determined that water service is available to serve phase three of this development, 20 lots maximum, the development of future phases of the subdivision cannot be served until improvements are made uh, with such improvements to be at the expense of the owner uh, and the developer. In addition, at the time <coughs> of future phases, phase four and beyond, are ready to be developed, the developer must submit a request for water service application to determine if water is in fact available for the remaining phases. Uh, our next comment was, uh, since no request for water service application has been filed for phase three of the Highlands Property Ridge, the consulting engineer for the project should contact me, um, the general manager of the district, to initiate that process and request that a current developer's agreement uh, be prepared. Uh, and our last comment was, as with all projects in the district service area, the developer must meet the current requirements of the district uh, in regards to the provision of water service to this phase of the development. Thank you. Yep. We have anyone else wish to speak on this case today? Mr. Rye. Mike Rye, I'm a boat designer representing Universal Builders. <clears throat> um, I don't think we have any conflicts. It is, it is uh, expired. That's on me. We, we let it slip, but it is a renewal of a previously approved preliminary plan, and we would request, request your approval. Thank, Thank you. you. We have anyone else here today wish to speak on this case? Yes, sir. Nathan Quinn here representing Mr. Paul Bowles, the property to the west. Just want to make sure there's still language in the approval if it's granted that water services and utility services be stud to the property line to the west. That was something we spoke about at the last meeting. But man, I think I can speak to that. Mr. Rufield and I spoke at length yesterday or the day before, can't remember. Um, there are multiple lot lines along that common boundary and the owner has, or the developer has uh, agreed, and he is here by the way, he can not his head, we can provide one or multiple points of connection. Okay. Should that answer your question, Mr. Quinn? Yes, sir, it does. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Anyone else wishing to speak on this case today? Do we have any questions from our board? Just what Tom said earlier. You still recommend, Tom? Is this established? Yes, sir. Okay. We're somewhat hamstrung a little bit by changes in state law that change vesting over and above what our subdivision regulations call for. So they had a preliminary plan approved that didn't actually show the connection that we've been uh, stating we strongly prefer. If it were a brand new flat, we would be uh, requesting that more of a requirement style language. But we would still appreciate consideration of the connection to the Bowles property uh, for, for uh, traffic circulation purposes. But due to vesting laws in the state of Tennessee, I don't think I have, a, or you as a board, have the authority to uh, vary too much from that, that vesting uh, that they already have. Mr. Ryan, question for you, sir. Sir. Uh, how long do you think before you would have that document that they spoke about? The developer that, agreement? Yes, sir. Well, I'll give you a little history. The construction plans for this phase are done. The change in environmental regulations post the you know, 20 election caused some um, extra work and some delays and that's why I'm, that's why it took us so long to get to the point that we can move on but Mr. Earhart would like to proceed as soon as he possibly can as soon as this is done we will follow up with Eric get that done and as soon as it can be done so weeks not months basically. absolutely yeah. thanks sir yeah. that's all the questions thank you any other questions from our board do we have a motion Motion to approve. We have a motion to approve from Ms. Weathers. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second from Mr. Thompson. All those in favor vote aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. We'll now move into the new business, Tom. Mr. Chairman, you have a copy of the resolution. Uh, uh, Tom, let's hold on one second here, uh, if you don't mind, sir. Uh, I am going to make a motion that we move. Uh, <coughs> This and the uh, uh, coach change to the end of the, end of the agenda. Second. I have a motion and a second. Would you to re accept the amendment to that? that yes, sir. Take that second resolution before the first one. The one about the problem. I, I have no problem with that. Is that okay with you, Jerry? Yes. Sir. Yeah, I mean, that's for information purposes only. Right. Okay. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor of vote aye. 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 And those opposed? That motion will carry. Okay, so. Moving on, our next uh, next item that I understand on the agenda <laughs> is a uh, a site plan uh, for Midway and 40 Monument site. Uh, site plan meets requirements. Labeling utility district requests that the sign contractor field stake the location of the proposed monument sign prior to any excavation related to the construction of the sign, and that the district be notified when the staking has been completed so that we may make sure that there's no conflict between the district water lines and appurtenances and the sign footing itself. Um, I've also been made aware by my stormwater department they still not received the review fees. Is that correct, James? It's on this sign site plan, so they will need to receive those before we can proceed with the building. Okay. Thank you. Do we have anyone else here wishing to speak on this case today? We have a motion from our board. Motion to approve. We have a motion to approve from Mr. Ash. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion to second uh, to approve. All those in favor of vote aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion carries. The next item we have on the agenda, Mr. Chairman, is a site plan for West Elementary School. They're placing, uh, I believe, five portables on the property. Uh, uh, this is on one lot, it's on the school property. Uh, they are putting them in the approximate location of the current basketball court, and they are relocating the basketball court. On the uh, with minor technical correction, staff can recommend approval. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, sir, Mr. Ash. So, Tom, I've never seen something like the portables coming through here before. I mean, you probably have some time in your career, but. Mm -hmm. that, it, they, they technically do not have to come through our process if they do not wish because they're considered an equivalent uh, government jurisdiction. Um, but as a courtesy, they're choosing to come through, so they're effectively they're, they're trying to follow the same rules as anybody else would. Still the same guidelines for fire protection and access. <coughs> I'm sorry? Still the same access, fire protection, truck availability can get around these. They're not yeah. so yes, tight that they. They're still circulatory routes. 
to the property. And you do recommend approval? Yes. Okay. We have anyone here wishing to speak on this case today? <clears throat> Um, morning, Jay Porter, CSDG of the Engineering Project. Um, just wanted to uh, appreciate the staff always working with us on uh, projects like this. Like I said, um, I don't say have to be here, but it's definitely a courtesy that we, um, we come forward just to get any comments or questions that we can work through it in, uh, in a joint manner. Um, but uh, we agree with all the, the staff's comments and uh, thank you for consideration. Thank question. you, sir. Uh, and a question for our attorney. I, I've interpreted that correctly. Yes, you did. They they uh, prefer to play by the same rules as everybody else. Do we have anyone else here wishing to speak on this case today? Any questions from our board? Do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Motion to approve from Ms. Weathers. Do we have a second? Second. We'll have a second from Mr. Turner. All those in favor vote aye. Aye. And those opposed? <clears throat> motion carries. Ready for the site plan at the Connect, uh, Connect Church parking lot? Yes, sir. Uh, this is a, a fairly uh, cut and dry uh, parking expansion, and with uh, minor technical correction, staff can recommend approval for an existing church on this property. Anyone here we should speak on this case today? Quarter CSDG, uh, same thing, just engineering uh, side of this, and again, uh, we agree, agree with all the comments from staff, and uh, appreciate all the other help, and uh, any questions I can answer, please. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak on this case today? Do we have any questions from our board? Since it's a courtesy, I'll have a question for Tom. This is not a courtesy. This, this, not this one is a courtesy. Oh, we're good. So all the quantities required for the, the occupants within the building are met with handicap as well? Okay. Any other questions from our board? Does it require payment? I'm sorry? Does it require being paid? Yes. There will be full payment, full striping, uh, curb, stormwater. Just for reference, if, if you're not on, uh, <coughs> I have to look at the language, it's either a state <laughs> highway or a major thoroughfare in our, in our requirements churches do not technically have to pay unless they're on one of those roads that meet those two criteria in this case they are paving they're on state highway state highway paved county roads they don't have to pay is that what you're saying I, 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 there may be some language about if they reach a certain thoroughfare classification they have to pay but okay. in general terms yes that's correct okay any other questions <clears throat> do we have a motion Motion. A motion to approve by Mr. Jewell. Do we have a second? Second. A second by Mr. Renfro. All those in favor vote aye. Uh, aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we're ready for the final for the Jamie Lee Roddy and Zach Hemmertoller property on East Richmond Shop Road. Yes, sir. Uh, this is an eight lot subdivision off East Richmond Shop Road. Uh, you saw the preliminary a couple of months ago, I believe. Uh, <coughs> It's zone day one, uh, agricultural, and staff can recommend approval subject to formal stormwater review being completed. I understand uh, stormwater has been in the process of reviewing the property uh, uh, based on preliminary review and comments, and they're still in the process of doing so. There's, if you'll recall, there's, a, and I don't have the FEMA map here, but there's a, there's a floodplain uh, that comes through this tract and stops somewhere right in here in terms of studied area but if it were to continue it would continue down this creek and there was some concern about it affecting the lots to either side that are being requested so that's among the things that are studying to make sure that we don't need to make those critical lots and or size culverts along east richmond shop road appropriately thank you okay. thank you yes sir mr crock yeah paul crock at crock and sir i think we've addressed all the planning comments and as tom said we're waiting for final review from uh, Warren and Associates on the drainage. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else wishing to speak on this case today? Do we have any questions from our board? Yes, sir. Mr. Yes, sir. Tom, that strip of land on the other side that you showed? Yes, sir. Very thin. Is the setbacks prohibitive for building anything in there? I couldn't tell with by scale. Where are you referring to, Mr. Renfro? Right there. 
all the way to the left, right here. No, way, way. See how that little strip is drawn around? That tiny little strip on the and that's left. That's access to the track lines. Oh, over here. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. That uh, that's a. <coughs> uh, I mean, it's showing a part of the To the parent track. If you'll go to the next slide, I think it'll show what you're actually platting, which are the, the lots that are below five acres. Okay. They're, they're keeping the parent track intact, and I believe that sliver is over here somewhere. It is, but the setbacks prohibit regardless for any kind of building. Yes, yes. In the sliver. Yes, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak on this case today? Any further questions from our board? Do we have a motion? Motion to approve. I have a motion to approve for Mr. Turner. Do we have a second? Second. I have a second for Ms. Weathers. All those in favor vote aye. Uh, uh, can I get uh, some consideration for that being subject to staff comments and also subject to final engineering review? That would be up to Mr. Turner. Uh, Mr. Turner, you want to include the subject staff recommendations in your? Yes. We have a motion to approve subject staff recommendations for Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner, do we have a second? Second. A second for Ms. Weathers. All those in favor vote aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Yes, sir. Now ready for the preliminary from Montgomery Estates. Uh, this is a preliminary for uh, subdivision called Montgomery Estates. This is a little bit different than ones we've seen in recent months anyways. It's a, it's a proposed 10 lot subdivision. Uh, this is Cairo Bend Road. This is Harbor Point subdivision. Go to the next slide if you will. Um, these are the lots they're proposing. Um, help me out, Christopher. What are the acreage range? They're anywhere from two point. The smallest one on Cairo Bend. So this is a 2.3 acre tract, and all these other tracts are over three. There's two of them that are five plus. And there's two of them that are five plus, but they're 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 proposing to extend the public road system out of uh, Harbor uh, Point subdivision uh, to cul-de-sacs that they will then uh, get driveway access to each of the lots they're creating. I did talk to the builder. Uh, or the developer uh, that's doing this on the front end and I said you know with the, the size of the lots and everything I, I don't think that you've got a huge issue but I do question whether or not you wouldn't be better off coming in with a construction entrance at the very least even if you're going to have your permanent access off the park from subdivision having a construction entrance coming off of uh, Cairo Bend Road uh, he at the time was not uh, happy to do, do so nor did he feel that we had any means for requiring to do so, but just for the record, that's what I want you to. So, is he doing it, Tom, or what's? No, the... he's he's proposing to do all his construction from those two cul sacs he's constructing. So he was planning to go through the middle of those houses, to put down a cul de sac, yes, sir. and run his construction company, and all that stuff through that subject. Yes, sir. Okay. Anyone here wish to speak on this case today? Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, did not, board. I, I didn't. I didn't do my comments. I apologize. I apologize, Mr. Uh, Mr. I'm sorry. That's my fault. Sorry. We can recommend approval subject to WEMA requirement for the cold sack being 94 foot pavement and a width and with road commission staff concurrence of that. Um, part of the reason we've got to do that is because we just adopted uh, international fire code, and the international fire code states that cold sacks will be 94 feet. Our subdivision regulations is more the road commission standards have caught up with that yet. We currently require, I believe, an 80-foot paved section for the cold sack. So that's something that we've got to work out between the agencies. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, sir. I apologize. That, that, that's fine, Mr. Chairman. Members of the board, Jerry McFarland, Commissioner of District 5, better known as Possum Town. <laughs> uh, had to get that in. Uh, I had the privilege of going down and visit this neighborhood uh, two days ago, late in the afternoon. Uh, the house is set about 30 feet off the road. I believe that's the setback living on. So when a child comes out the front door of the, of the house, about as far from here to where the mayor sits, they're in the street. When I got there, all I saw was bicycles and children playing. Uh, 
probably more than half of them in the street. Uh, it's a dangerous situation to use those cul-de-sac roads, those dead-end roads after construction and or add additional traffic to it. Can you go back to the first slide, Tom? Yes, sir. Uh, I got one, thank you. <laughs> the gentleman has, I, I didn't mean to be sarcastic, I just, I just thought this morning about four o'clock I'd bring my own. Uh, I can't see it. Sir? I can't see it. No, you can't see it. At any rate, he has a, has a right of way all the way in from Carroll Bend Road. I don't know how wide it is, probably uh, close to a couple hundred feet. Uh, there's no reason that that cannot be used <laughs> both as a construction road and as a permit road to any house they want to build along here or back in this area here. I mean, roads should be put in. There is water back along these stuff, so water could be picked up there, but it's just absolutely too dangerous to use either one of these uh, short roads to go into that when this is available to him. Uh, so I have no choice but to ask that you deny this based on the way it's dropping. Any questions for me, sir? Is that a separate track that goes out to the road or is that a it, it's all, track? Same owner. It's the same. I believe it's all. That's not two separate tracks. I think it is two separate tracks. Yeah, it's the same owner. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'm Jennifer Becker. I live in the summit of Harbor Point at 428 Harbor Cove. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Uh, my house is the second on the right-hand side to the farm. It would be from the end of the farm. Uh, what I would also like to ask is that you deny as these plans are drawn. We have approximately 80 to 84 homes within our subdivision and approximately 50 children within, our, within those homes. And um, that's not including grandchildren that visit people. Uh, it, so for us, the residents, it is a safety concern as we do not have sidewalks. With our limited lawn space, most of the children do play in the streets. We have several people who walk and run in the neighborhood. It would also be a risk to them to see construction vehicles coming in and out. Um, I guess I have questions of being, since our subdivision is complete with phase one and two, how many other subdivisions within Wilson County that are complete, that our HOA plan development allow access to something such as this, that I would think would probably be zoned as rural residential. So they would be accessing our subdivision without paying the same dues that we are required to pay. Who's going to govern the use of community space to those homeowners if they're accessing through our subdivision? I don't know who could answer those questions for me, but I would love to hear the responses for that. Um, additionally, the homeowners at 430 Zephyr Cove, if they use the cul-de-sac as an entrance and as the construction development, They've not had adequate time to review their deed of trust and to see how far their property extends to the cul-de-sac. So will they be losing part of their acreage in their front lawn? So we are asking that you do deny us strong. We need more time to look at this. We're not asking that the developer not develop on this. I think it's a great idea. We're just asking don't use our neighborhood. Give us a little bit more respect than that. Um, and also, I do want to point out, um, as Jerry stated, there is the ingress and egress on Cairo Bend that this gentleman could use to do all of his construction and to allow any future homeowners access to that site. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> do you want to take a crack at our questions, Tom? <laughs> I'll do my best to. Um, the track is eligible for far more lots under zoning if they use a public sewer system than what this developer is proposing at present. As I stated, most of the, uh, or all the lots are above, I think, 2.7 acres um, in, in this particular proposal. The stub outs 
that you have at Zephyr Cove at the end and at the unnamed stub out because it did not warrant the name of being, only being one lot deep at present, were both designed and installed for the purposes of continuation of development uh, and continuation <coughs> of road. And I'll let you speak, but let me finish. <laughs> um, so, so those, those were, from a planning perspective, required when the Summit at Harbor Point subdivision was put in to stub out for the purposes of, again, again allowing connection to potentially developable tracks. Um, ideally, if, well not ideally, but if, if he had maximized density, depending on how many lots he got out of it, there may have been a requirement at this point for a secondary connection to Cairo Bend by public roadway. But being that it's less than 100 lots, which is a requirement right now, Less than that. We don't have any requirement to require that cross connection to occur. And secondly, these are public roadways, so they have every right to extend them as long as they pay the letters of credit, go through the road commission approval, and extend those two cul sacs. Um, now, I still have a problem with my responses I got from the developer uh, with regard to construction traffic. I don't really see, I, I told him at the time that I thought he was buying himself problems when he didn't otherwise necessarily warrant them because he is doing a large lot subdivision in this particular uh, instance. And at the very least, he could take the construction traffic off Cairo Bend by building a construction hall road off Cairo Bend directly and building back of that as he went. He stated he did not have any desire to do so. That's, I don't know if he's here or not. But. Can I speak to that? No, just, oh, if you, uh, we'll get to you, I promise. Okay. Uh, and Tom, as far as the cul-de-sac, uh, those those numbers are taken calculated into the proportion of the people's lots. As she's asking if they would lose part of their lots because of the cul-de-sac. Those numbers were factored in on the front end yes. as far as the acreage goes. Yes, sir. Now, if there's a temporary turnaround there now, um, they, they may uh, actually reclaim a portion of that cul-de-sac because it's, it's had to bulb out for a turnaround. And there, there may be uh, some Might be possibility additions. for them to, to gain the uh, deconstruction of the cul de sac there since he's been in the property. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the clarification. I still would like to know if that is a temporary cul de sac. When our subdivision was developed, it was phase one and phase two. That developer, I believe it was Cairo 70 Investors, did file bankruptcy. Yes, so. I don't know if he had the thought that there would be a phase three. It would make sense to me if this developer is going to use our subdivision, would it not then become phase three? No, ma'am, not necessarily. But from the particular from the standpoint that we would require these stub outs on any potentially developable mm -hmm. tract uh, with a of significant acreage, we try to mm -hmm. uh, to secure cross connections so that if there was a, a significant wreck, or something that there people have other means in and out of property. In this particular case, because he's doing a, a, a 10 lot uh, uh, subdivision, uh, we don't have a lot of requirements to require the secondary connection. So if if it was approved that he did access through our subdivision, um, what is the dollar amount or do you have an estimate of the damage that will be done to our roads for all the construction and will wilson county then be responsible for fixing those roads those are good questions the road commission oversees that process they do require a maintenance letter of credit for designated haul roads uh, for no construction sites uh, prior to uh, planning of the property so in addition to having to submit and secure letters of credit and submit those to the road commission for the road work he's doing to extend the roads. He'll also have a maintenance letter of credit for the existing roadways uh, for maintenance and upkeep of those uh, as becomes necessary. And the idea would be that the developer will be on the hook to go back and <coughs> repair that. Um, but if push came to shove, the road commission could call the letter of credit and do it themselves. And should he file bankruptcy also like KRA 70 investors? That's what what letter, happens? That's what the letter of credit The le letter of credit will cover off. That road is not, uh, 
responsible in any way to the homeowners association, though. It is a county road. It, it is a county road. It's not a gated community. It's not a private road. Yeah. So the, he's, he's dealing with the road commission, not with the uh, homeowners association. That's they <coughs> develop it. Yes, sir. Okay. As far as you asked one other series of questions about the, sub, the uh, homeowners association, that really is strictly the purview of the HOA to take up with the neighboring developer as to whether or not they wish to uh, uh, partake in your HOA or the uh, community amenities if they were to take advantage of them or something. So would those lots and potential homes conform to our neighborhood? <coughs> they, don't have, they don't have to. They don't have now, to. based on my discussion with them, I don't anticipate that they're going to be significant different from the types of houses that are in the neighborhood. But uh, uh, I can't dictate property balances. But uh, in my discussions with the gentleman, I believe you mentioned million dollar home. <coughs> Within this market, that's a little scary. And I also have photos of the cul-de-sac at Zephyr Cove. However, the other access point that he's referred to as Montgomery Lane there is not an existing cul-de-sac. It is just a dead end road that is blocked by a fence right now. So I don't know if anybody would like to see the photos, but I have four copies you wouldn't that you all have. And because it was one lot B, um, the road commission, as I understand it, does not require turnarounds constructed in the same way they did on Zephyr Cove on, on one zone and one lot B. Thank you. All right, thank you for your time. I have a question, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir, Mr. Ash. Uh, not just probably to Tom, but in the 911 system, it, will this become, say, his construction road becomes street? Well, his construction road right now is proposed is to come down Harbor Point, and I guess it's being called Montgomery Lane, stub out in Zephyr Cove. But if we don't prove him coming through the subdivision? If you don't approve him coming through the subdivision, uh, short of legal action, I think the only option he would have is to construct a road off of Carroll Avenue. So, so that's my question. So, will those let be a rural mail route? And the reason I say that, you know, because if 911 calls come in, I guess we'd have to name that road, that street, right? Well, that would come. He would. He would have to name. He would have to design in a public road off Carroll Avenue, and it would have a public name, and all of those houses would then be addressed off that road. In this case, they're going to be off. I'm assuming Montgomery Lane, which is the shorter stub out, and Zephyr Cove, they'll have additional address. Tom, how many places do we have a situation like this where access is uh, reasonable from another end like this where we have construction? How many more do we have like that where we have possibly requested them to make that a street at the completion of the project? We we have a few that come up. More often than not, we have some that come up where we're doing kind of what we did with this one, where we're having them stub out to a potentially developable track to get you eventually back to a public road. Uh, in this instance, with them doing the larger lot track take down of like eight to ten lots, we just don't have any requirements for them to make that secondary connection like we normally would. Is it appropriate? Do we have the authority to uh, require that as part of the development? That would be a question for County Attorney Jennings. He's busy. As presented, there is no public road coming from Cairo being connected to this piece of property. Do we have the authority to require him to add a uh, permit road, county road, from Cairo Bend up to this property? given that he has access to the public road system in other places. Say that again. <laughs> given that he has access to the public road system in other places. He has two calls that are the property, property line. Okay. Where it widens out up here off of the subdivisions. Right. But he also has a connecting tract that ties into the front gate road. Okay. So he's proposing a call to uh, a road that's going to end in the call to say that's going to be a private road? Sacks. Sorry? Is that going to be a private road? No. He's proposing two cul-de-sacs off the end of Zephyr Cove and off that stub out just okay. before it gets narrow. They're, also, they're asking if they can require him to build a public road off the Cairo Bend instead of utilizing the existing public cul-de-sacs. I don't know if I feel comfortable answering that question. I'm going to do a little research for that. 
Okay. Under that is also not a permanent road, but a construction access. Is there any latitude we have there to say, do not use what's already existing? You already have a flag entrance off Carolina. So you've always got to be careful telling the man what he's going to do with his property. So I'd, I'd like to take a little time and look at that. I don't feel comfortable. So what you recommend we defer until you have a chance? Y'all do whatever you want to. I don't feel comfortable shooting from the hill on this. Let me tell you, if you have a chance to hear my question more ago, you do not want to turn it also. Yes, sir. If it comes in off the of main road, what I don't want to happen back here with six, seven, eight, lots, ten, whatever, it'd be, it'd be lot one, lot two, not have proper numbering for mail and there won't be a kiosk on this side, will it? There will be a mail kiosk on okay. this side. But, but when, you know what I'm saying, getting those flag lot situations and yeah. you don't know where, which house to have to go to. Yeah, what we, what we do in other situations where they're accessed by common uh, access is that there's several lots and we give them the number and then A, B, C, D, E. It's not the best way in the world to do it, but that's probably sometimes that's the only way to do it. Because we, have, as you know, we number off the public road. Right. Yep. Next, we're putting another road off the public road. Yeah, it's a public road. Correct. This is not this similar to some discussion you may recall with Ferguson uh, Ridge subdivision in a neighborhood that went through their neighborhood for access. Do we have anyone else here wishing to speak on this case today? Yes, sir, if you would please come forward. Everybody, my name is Thomas Hopkins. I'm the applicant. Uh, I just wanted to address what Mr. Bashir had said. I had met with him and Mr. Lawless. They mentioned the construction easement. I told them I was going to, the plan would be to sell lot one off Cairo Bend Road first. But there's actually an easement that runs below this property to that 42 acres in the back. So Matt Taylor, my engineer from SEC, couldn't make it today. He actually resubmitted plans to those guys the end of last week showing a construct using that as a construction easement uh, that would go back there and then that would handle the traffic on lots two through six and that cul-de-sac. So I just wanted to address that that has been resubmitted to you guys. Uh, and I haven't I haven't heard that said here today yet. So uh, we'll look at our files, but we're not aware of it. I mean, I've got it on email, on two different emails that he sent it. So uh, I just wanted to say that we, again, Mr. Bashir, he's right. I, when he first, when we first talked, I was like, the public road, just, it's only nine lots. But I get it. I understand the concerns. Uh, but at the same time, so we have come back, addressed it with, there is a construction easement. So I just, I wanted to say that for the record, that that has been resubmitted. So. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Be glad. You don't, have any, future, not you don't here, have any future plans of going through a cul de sac. No, no so not being there. He's well, still proposing to. Have yeah, his that, that would just be where the car, you know, the driveways would come off on these cul de sacs. What he's proposing is a yeah. construction. But there is from a different location. Yes, sir. It would come off Carroll Bend. That would take care of the construction traffic. But again, you know, when the houses get built and people live there, they, they would come off the cul de sac. Okay. So, thank you. Okay. Is there <laughs> Please. Uh, as he mentioned, I'm with SEC. I'm John Miner. Uh, Matt Taylor couldn't make it here today. Um, but yes, as he said, we do have plans um, to. Uh, yeah, no, you're good. Uh, to, uh, yeah, I was hiding on the back. Uh, it, and it is um, noted on the plat that uh, the construction, all construction for lots one through six will uh, come through Cairo Road. Um, and the reason that it wasn't extended back farther is essentially because of the soils um, where the construction entrance would be located um, to go through those uh, remaining four lots uh, would basically go through the soil area and make make those uh, non buildable lots that that's the reason why go to the next slide if you will so wh which lots would not be served by the construction entrance? uh yes yeah, seven eight nine and ten those four correct so you would be constructing one, two, three, four, five, and six. Here, correct. Okay, road back. Yes, sir. But you're still going to end up running construction traffic through the neighborhood to get to these four. Yes, for the the last four. And you've not, y'all, you, your staff hadn't laid eyes on this right time, or haven't had time to deal with. It. Well, we. Whether you we got it or not, we don't know. So. I understand. 
I understand. Um, and then kind of to address a couple of the other comments. Um, we are um, going with the 96 foot uh, cul-de-sac to, to make the fire code. Um, and then... Subject to commission acceptance of that. Correct, correct. Um, and then um, as it was, as you stated earlier, um, none of the property, the existing properties would lose any, any, um, any of their property. By extending the uh, cul-de-sac, we are continuing from the existing right of way um, to our property uh, with, with the road or the cul-de-sac. Okay. Um, and as he stated, um, on the temporary, um, depending on how it was, which I don't know offhand, um, they could could gain access to that, that temporary uh, turnaround portion. Um, and then as it was kind of stated, um, the responsibility for road maintenance during construction, since we are going through the development uh, for the last four lots, um, there will be a bond in place um, and it will be the developer's responsibility um, to uh, maintain it during construction. It'll be a letter of credit. Correct. Uh, letter of credit, excuse me. Um, letter of credit and if for whatever reason, um, as, as there was concern about if they went bankrupt, left, or any other option, uh, the letter could be pulled and the money is already would already be in place to for the, the uh, county to um, um, basically fix fix the roads if it was damaged. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. Tom, are you clear on all this? No. no. <laughs> I move that we defer this. I know they're wanting to work, but I just feel better if we ever, everybody got on the same page. Mike had a chance to research that other issue and bring us up next month. I make that motion. Second. Well, well, it's we, have, it's, we, we have what we've got here. We have a motion from Mr. Jewell to defer to the next meeting. Yes. And we have a second from Mr. Thompson. Uh, all those in favor vote aye. Uh -huh. Those opposed, Deferred. we will continue this for 30 days, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Come back. Uh, I think we're. Yes, yes, sir. Next item is Autumn Breach, Auto Breach Subdivision, basis two through four, uh, 2600 South Mount Juliet Road. Uh, this is in the Commissioner of Day and Weather District, 99 parcels 88 and 88.03, consists of 37 lots. Uh, again, this is a preliminary flat approval with my technical correction staff can recommend approval subject to the WEMA requirement of the cul de sac that's. Uh, I was thinking that was 94, 96 feet. That says 94 feet. I, I may have that wrong. Anyways, it's the new uh, ICC requirement for cul de sac with payment with, with road commission staff concurrence because the road commission is the one that only has to maintain whatever cul de sac is put in there. Uh, Lake Utility District comments uh, include in previous discussions with the developer and design consultant for this project, the district has made it very clear. Uh, that as a requirement for providing water service to the project, the water line will have to be extended off-site to the north and connected to an existing water line at Fredericksburg Drive. This connection is mandatory and the appropriate easements within the, the automobile subdivision, i.e. along the common boundary line between lots 13 and 14 in the current configuration, will be required to facilitate off-site work. Uh, and then it says on July 28, 2022, a form of the agreement was issued to the developer and design consultant, but the, the, the agreement has never been executed and no fees were paid. The document is now void and, revised, and a revised developer agreement must be requested by the developer or design consultant. And this is all the utility district business. As with all projects in the district service area, the developer must meet the current requirements of the district in regard to the provision of water service to this phase of development. Yes, sir, Mr. Rye. Mike Rye with uh, Lowe's Designer of City University Builders. The real purpose for this plat it was to add lots. There were three, there were three additional lots on this preliminary that were not achievable due to sanitary sewer capacity at the time. Mr. Lidbert, could, I believe he's here, he could add some, add some color there, but it, basically they, there was some permitting that had to be done to increase capacity. So that's been done, so we're back to subdivide that one large lot. Okay. <coughs> Anyone else wish to speak on this case today? 
We have any questions from our board? Tom, um, lot 13 and 14 that you just read, is that the end of the red uh, enclosed area? Right before? I believe so. So those people that exist, that are yeah, very dark. Right here. Yes. And there was homes there, right? Uh, no, no. I don't think there's homes there at present. Okay. There's lots. <coughs> Look like they were homes, huh? They don't see anything. Okay. Can you those show them up here? Frederick, those are in Fredericksburg. There's a road so right here. No, oh, I know. That's the water line we go down. Okay. No, good. there's not a road there. Okay. Well, there's a there's there's either a private that, road or a non-approved public road. Right it. One of the two. Thank you, sir. This uh, that's it. Sir. We have any other questions from our board? We have a motion. Motion to approve. So a motion to approve subject to recommendations from Ms. Weathers. Sure. Second from Mr. Ash. All those in favor vote aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. And just for clarity, Tom, uh, that plat would have to be signed by the utility district before it could actually be recorded and dealt with. Yes, sir. So they'll have to deal with those issues, Mr. Wright? Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. I can't speak for Mr. Wright, but I'll tell you, we will not accept plat. Mm -hmm. It's got you're going to work your stuff out with Glable Utility District. That was my question. All right. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, we have the following plans for affirmation. We have a subdivision of the Carl W. Wright property on Lone Oak Road. Uh, in District 13, the Commissioner Jerry Hobbs District consists of one lot, and its reference is Map 122, part of Parcel 11, is owned all one. We have a re re subdivision of the Frank Oliver Estate, lots 14A and 14B. On Coles Ferry Pike in District 5, Commissioner Jerry McFarland's district, consisting of one lot, and reference is Map 35, Parcel 6 and 6.01, uh, Zone Day 1. Resubdivision of the Ruby Hasty property on Lot 1 in Linwood Road area uh, in District 7, Commissioner Terry Scruggs district, consisting of one lot, and reference is Map 106, Parcel 25.01, and being Zone Day 1, Agricultural. Resubdivision of the James Mann property on West Salisbury Road in District 15, Commissioner Chris Dow's district, consisting of one lot, and being referenced as Map 85, parcel 20.04, being zoned A1 Agricultural. Subdivision of the Robert Van Hooser Jr. property on Corn Springs Road in District 17, Commissioner of Rusty Keith's district, consisting of one lot, and being referenced as Map 46, parcel 37, and zoned R1. Resubdivision of the Gerald Blair property consisting of one lot on Atkinson Road, uh, being a District 12, Commissioner Haskell Evans District. References Map 114, Parcel 24.01, being zoned A1. Resubdivision of the Gerald Blair property, Lot 2, on Atkinson Road, uh, in District 12, which is Commissioner Haskell Evans District, consisting of one lot and being referenced as Map 114, Parcel 24.02. Subdivision of the Glen Carlton Wright property on Bluewell Road uh, within District 9, Commissioner Blake Hall's district, uh, consisting of one lot and being referenced as Map 144, Parcel 52, is on day one. And subdivision of the Janice Stewart property on Trail Bell Ferry Park, Pike, uh, District 15, Commissioner Chris Dadley's district, consisting of one lot, being referenced as Map 64, Parcel 27.03, being on day one. Um, Resubdivision of the Bob McCrary property, consisting of two lots, uh, being further reference is 46.19 McCrary Road and District 13, Mr. Jerry Hobbs District, Jeremy Hobbs District. Uh, reference is Map 141, Parcel 18.10 and Zone Day 1. Subdivision of Judith Kemp property, consisting of two lots, uh, being reference is 62.01 Old Murphy's Borough Road. In District 12, Commissioner Haskell Evans District, and being further reference is Map 114, Parcel 35.04, and being zoned A1. Subdivision of the GLR Revocable Trust property and George W. Robinson property at 3720 Below Ferry Road. Uh, within District 6, Commissioner Beth Bowman District. Again, it's two lots, and it's reference is Map 15, Parcel 16, and 16.02, and zoned A1. And a combination plat for the uh, uh, Caleb Thorne property, it's a Thorne Consolidation Plat, it's a label consisting of one lot at Misty Lake Drive and North Street, and being referenced as Map 16E, Parcel, or Group C, Parcel 28. 
And this is again in District 6, Commissioner Beth Bowman District in Zone Day 1. All of those plats are <laughs> one or two lot subdivisions that have met with staff approval as permitted by state law in this planning commission through policy uh, uh, to go through a staff approval process. And so we have been reviewing those and all of those either meet staff comments or come very close there too and we won't report until they do. You've been busy this week. Thank you for that. <laughs> do we have anyone here today wishing to speak on any of these cases? Do we have any questions from our board? Do we have a motion? So moved. A motion to approve something by Mr. Jewell. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second from Mr. Ricketts. All those in favor vote aye. Aye. And those opposed? Motion mm -hmm. carries. We'll now revert back to the policy changes, Tom. Okay. And you want me to do the uh, informational one? If you'll do the informational one. For informational purposes, um, no vote being required by this board uh, or by this planning commission. Uh, the Wilson County Commission at their Monday, February 27, 2023 meeting approved resolution 23-2-10, which was a resolution adopting the 2021 edition of the International Building Code, which is, I understand is the most up-to-date International Building Code in its uh, entirety. Uh, the International Residential Code the international, uh, which the International Residential Code, we already have an adopted version. We, by doing this, we have, we moved up to the 2021 version of the uh, IRC. And by state law, we're required to stay, I believe, in uh, either five or six years of the most current code. Uh, so that puts us in good stead with the, uh, the code validity. Uh, the International Fire Code was also adopted in addition to the uh, uh, International Fire Protection Agency, or National Fire Protection Agency, NFPA 101 Life Safety Code, otherwise referenced as NFPA-101. The International Plumbing Code, ITC. Uh, the International Mechanical Code, IMC. The International Fuel and Gas Code, IFC. And the International Energy Code, which is IECC. And uh, all of those, I believe, were attached to your agenda. Uh, effectively, what this means is that we have officially adopted commercial codes in Wilson County, which we have not previously adopted. In addition, we've adopted fire protection codes, and you've already seen some product of that with the uh, potential expansion of cul de sac width uh, that we're going to need to address eventually in our subdivision regulations and road commission standards if we choose to continue to. This will, establish, this will establish the fire marshal program also, won't it? Uh, my understanding is we might is uh, in the process of, of getting staff in place to, to undertake fire marshal review of new commercial buildings yes. as well as residential. They've already been doing some residential reviews, uh, but they will ramp up that review as well with this fire marshal. Is that subject to funding by the county commission? or is I, it? I believe so. Yes, sir. It's I a good thing to do, I think. I believe they funded it last last year yes. uh, in some form or fashion. We did. We did. <coughs> did I, did I you were there. <laughs> Tom, maybe this is a little preemptive, but will that program operate out of your department or out of WEMA? Well, it will operate out of the fire marshal's position specifically, or fire inspection, fire review will operate out of WEMA. However, uh, as has been done in other places I have worked, including Hendersonville and some other places. Um, on commercial stuff in particular, the fire marshal and my building inspection uh, office, uh, with whomever we've got designated to do the commercial building inspections with their certifications, will go out in tandem, both to review the plans but also to review on site. Uh, generally, they do that at the same time to kind of keep from one of them saying to do this and then they do that and then the other one needs this done first or something. So they try to work with us. Hand in hand. Yes, sir. Okay. Did you have questions about that, Mr. Ash? Okay. Okay, that was for information purposes. Uh, let's move on to the uh, zoning change. Zoning change. Okay. The other item, I'm going to pass something out. Uh, the, the resolution itself has the proposed changes. Um, I, I also gave you this last night in an email uh, of your packet information. Um, but this, this handout has the current standards 
with the proposed standards behind it, just in terms of breakdown. This is the same thing I shared with um, the Planning and Zoning Committee at their request to look into this. Uh, Planning and Zoning Committee being a committee of the County Commission. Um, and effectively, what this is doing after some number of years of various requests coming for us to look into the bids and allowances that we allow in our residential zones from different county commissioners over the years, coupled with the land use plan, I guess I should put in front of my work. <laughs> um, uh, what I was saying was uh, this amendment comes after several years of various county commissioners asking me to look into the density allowances uh, that we allow in our residential zone districts, uh, coupled with the, the original land use plan public input meetings that we've had for this current cycle of amending our land use plan, which is on hold, as you understand, due to the uh, urban growth boundary negotiations on one with the city of Mount Juliet, city of London, city of Lock County, the county. Um, because that's on pause, um, and given <coughs> additional requests by county commissioners to look into these density counts uh, that we allow in our different residential zone districts, uh, we did draft uh, a resolution that effectively changes those, and those changes are as follows. One of the big things that we've heard from at least one, one county commissioner over the years is that they did not like the differential in the R1 district for public sewer versus septic provision. Right now in the, A, in the R1 district, uh, we would allow 25,000 square foot lots if you've got more than one lot you're creating uh, on public sewer, and public sewer could include steps. Um, if you're not on public sewer, then you, you, you default to a septic uh, lot size requirement, which is 40,000 square feet. However, there is a provision that the state of Tennessee, if they find good enough soils, can allow 30,000 square foot lots in the Arlington District. That differential has caused confusion uh, to many over the years. Uh, as we have grown as a region, people have become more growth fatigued. And, that coupled with some of that confusion has led us to believe that it's probably time for us to do away with that differential, whatever size that you choose to make the R1 district. But the R1 district, as proposed, we just went across the board and made it a 40,000 square foot minimum lot size. Uh, in an effort to try to maintain some hierarchy in the uh, districts, we also proposed changing the A1 district from a current 40,000 square foot lot, which is just shy of an acre, 43,560 square feet. Uh, in the A1 zone district, we chose to make the minimum requirement rather than being 40,000 square feet like it would be in R1 if this were passed, we chose to make that 80,000 square feet, which is a little bit shy of two acres. Um, and this is just in general terms. Um, we have an A2 district that is not used. There's not any A2 zoned on the ground, but we did create that district several years ago at the request of some who had expressed an interest in having an agricultural preservation district. The current zoning requirement for that district is a minimum of, of two acre lots. Uh, this would push it to uh, uh, four acre lots uh, for the A2 district. That being said, that we don't have any A2 that I'm aware of on the ground. That's anywhere. what you brought forward and call it state, state lots, correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but we don't have any of that at present. Um, no one has chosen to rezone to that. Um, the, on the going downward in terms of density, R2 has caused us some confusion as staff over the years. And if, if we're going to do this, I want to take the opportunity to get it cleaned up. One of the things in particular, R2 allows multifamily development as a use by right. However, the general provisions requires that it goes through a group housing procedure that makes them go to the Board of Zoning Appeals. The Board of Zoning Appeals really is not a body that is accustomed to reviewing uh, site development plans or residential development plans for that matter. Uh, so typically what would happen when we had very seldom submittals for multifamily development in the R2 district is they would go to the Board of Zoning Appeals, there's a public hearing at the Board of Zoning Appeals, maybe the public gets a chance to come and express their concerns or questions or support even. Uh, but 
at the same time, uh, the Board of Zoning Appeals will typically throw their hands up and say, well, we're not the board that does any technical review, so we, we're going to refer that to the planning board. So it gets referred back to y'all. Y'all have to make a technical review of it. It then goes back to the Board of Zoning Appeals. And me being honest, generally by that point, the developers withdrawn and decided to do something else. Uh, so I, to, to that point, I have not had a new R2 uh, multifamily zoning uh, done since I got here in 2001 because it's just an arcane and weird process. So that being said, I took our multifamily out of the R2 district because it's allow to use. I put it in R3. R3 zoning is a planned residential development uh, district and what that does, it, that does two things. One, it's a much more clear cut review process. Secondly, because there's there's only a few R3 pro properties out on the ground, it would require most every one of those uh, that choose to get developed uh, as multifamily out in the county, not in the cities, uh, to go through a rezoning process with a master plan. And it gives the county commission something that they've been asking for, which is additional control over those higher density developments. That being said, we haven't had any to speak of unless they were annexations in recent years in the cities. So, Anyways, we did that. We did uh, uh, the current single family allowance in R2, which we have had some development in, is 10,000 square feet. Again, in response to us increasing the, the overall lot size in the other districts, we did increase the single family lot size to 20,000 square feet, proposed to. Uh, it does allow two family dwellings, and those would be on a uh, 30,000 square foot lot, whereas right now they can put them on a 15,000 square foot lot. Um, in short, that's that's sort of what what's going on there. There is a section in the resolution that also talks about planned unit development. We had to amend those densities as well because, as you can see on the probably the second page back, um, the top of the page is the current density allowances, which is R1 allows 1.74 <coughs> units per acre as a rule, and with if they do a planned unit development. Uh, they get a 0.26 bonus uh, acreage per lot um, or uh, per development. And in R2, it's currently 4.36 units per acre with a 0.14 density bonus. And that's to uh, offset some of the additional costs the developer has to take on in the process of doing a planning development. Um, in, the, in the proposed amendment, those densities would decrease to a base density of 1.09 units per acre uh, in R1, and in R2 it will be 2.18 units per acre with uh, 0.35 and 0.32 density bonuses. And the last page, it, it just wouldn't fit on this page, those are, if you took a 100 acre development, which is the minimum residential park, <laughs> the difference in density bonus at current, you get 20 additional lots about, uh, in R1, you get 11 additional lots allowed in R2. As proposed, you would get 26 additional lots in R1 and 24 additional lots in R2 if someone chose to come in the plan. These last two pages just made the math work what you're proposing in the other district. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. Yes, sir. Does all this proposal still doesn't affect five acres? No, it does not. And nor does it affect anything that has a preliminary uh, plan of development or something that the uh, Home Builders Association got passed three to five years ago, which uh, uh, anybody that's got a preliminary plan of development in place, they've got anywhere from uh, two to five or five to 15 years uh, vested rights. So if they've already got a plan in here, they would be allowed to continue that plan as long as they don't allow it to expire beyond whatever that vesting is. And I'm going to have to, if this passes, that'll be one of those things I'll be confirming with the county attorney about how, how to administer that on the existing developments that we got. Um, so anybody that's already submitted and got approval for any type of preliminary plan of development, and I would I would interpret that to mean any rezoning for the PUD, uh, any, any sketch preliminary or final plat. It's already been approved, and even if it's not been reported, it has vested rights in the papers that we reviewed and approved. Sure. This would just be new, new development that's starting from scratch. And again, uh, I think in large part, over the past 15 years, we've grown extraordinarily. 
while that's being said, we account for approximately, we in the county, unincorporated area, account for approximately 15% of our overall residential uh, housing development starts, whether we're in a, in a high development cycle or whether we're in a low economy, low development cycle. We drop along between 12 and 15% of the uh, housing permits uh, countywide, uh, meaning that uh, what is that? About 85% of them are in the city of Mount Juliet, the city of Lebanon, and the city of Watertown. But truthfully speaking, Lebanon and Mount Juliet are present. Now, if I understand this correctly, this came out of the Planning and Zoning Committee of the County Commission yes. for us to review and to make a recommendation to the entire County Commission. That's and right. they will have final say so, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, it can, ordinances can start here or there. This one was requested of members of the County Commission to discuss the planning and zoning committee, and that's where we start. Okay. Uh, because of that, once they receive your recommendation, it'll go to the county commission. I would anticipate one way or the other. Okay. Okay. I'm going to open this up for public comment. I am going to ask you to keep your comments brief, less than two minutes, and try not to be repetitive in nature. I know a lot of people want to speak on this. We want everyone to have the opportunity to be heard. Uh, yes, sir. I'm David Yost, and I've lived in the Statesville community for 44 years, so I've been able to see the growth in the southeastern part of the county. I love the idea of going from 40,000 to 80,000 square feet for the lots in the A1 area. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the other areas of the county, but A1s. Uh, we're basically losing the character of our area down there in the southeast corner because of the amount of development that's taken place. And uh, uh, I strongly support going for 40,000 to 80,000 for developments that are going through the Planning Commission in the A1 area. Uh, I think it's probably not enough, okay? Uh, I do not know the zoning laws. And it sounds like A2 is a possibility of getting our zoning changed, but I'll let y'all comment on that. Uh, there's another thing I'd like to bring up is that uh, as of right now, and it looks like it's all across the state, that five acres, if you have a five acre plot, you don't even run that through the Planning Commission. That's correct. And I would like to see somebody take a look at that as well because there's a lot of development taking place where I don't think the Planning Commission, or for that matter, codes, are looking at hard enough uh, because they're putting in uh, houses and places and floods that are near flood zones or flood zones that are not identified as being flood zones. A good example of that is in my area at Night Creek. There's a gentleman in there right now that uh, is trying to develop the property and the recent rain event that we had two weeks ago would have flooded out the bridge. Now, I've got some great pictures of that, by the way. Uh, would have flooded the area where he's planning on putting things in. Now, that, that part of Knight Creek has not been examined for floodplains. So we need to take a more serious look at this so that, uh, you know, we don't end up with, with houses and flood zones in that area. And that's all I've got. Thank you, sir. Do we have anyone else wishing to speak on this today? Yes, sir. While he's coming up, I will respond to a couple of things. The A2 zone, the reason that we don't have any on the ground is because we really don't have the authority to zone property uh, of someone else's at this point, given changes in state law, unless we notify every affected property owner in the, in the county, which is, I think, over 62,937 parcels uh, by mail. Uh, but that don't include density changes? No, it doesn't because you're changing language in the zoning order itself. It's like if I was to assign a new zoning district to somebody else's property, it would be my the, uh, uh, the A2 would be at the uh, volition of the homeowner or property owner to apply for it. The, uh, uh, the other thing I'll mention out in rural areas, uh, there are certain provisions in state agricultural laws that do require farmers uh, not to uh, necessarily have to get a permit uh, 
even for our homes that are associated with the agricultural use. However, if they do that, we're not going to inspect them either for goats. So if they've got to get any type of bank loan, that may cause them problems to the finances and they can't get code inspections without paying for the permit. Okay. Yes, sir. Good morning. Randy Sexton with Landmark Homes of Tennessee. Just a, a question, actually just a point of clarification from Tom. Uh, Tom, on table one, it's, you're talking about uh, 40,000 square foot lots for R1. In table two, you're talking about a density of 1.09. Is the 1.09 only achievable if it's a PUD application? No, actually, unless my math's wrong, uh, that's used by 1.09 would be used by right. It would be if you wanted to exercise the additional density, which is uh, then we could get the 1.44. 1. 1. Okay, so it would be the 0.35 in addition yes. to the 1.09. Yes. Okay. All right. And same for the R2 with the 2.18. If there was a pilot application, if we could achieve a 2.50 versus the uh, 1.09. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 Well, R2 will allow a uh, single family, it will allow a uh, 20,000 square foot lot if this passes. With sewer and water. Yes. But with a step system. Well, that would be a step system as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We have anyone else wishing to speak on this case? This ordinance change? Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, my name is Mike Burton. I live at 2448 West Clay Drive. Um, I just have a couple comments to make. So um, I think there's a philosophical question um, going through Middle Tennessee as to how many housing units we need, um, density, and of course, migration trends. And um, I just want to point out a couple things uh, with respect to the impacts of down zoning in general. Um, they cause less tax revenue uh, while also increasing costs of services and maintenance because of all the sprawl that's caused by down zoning. Uh, in addition to that, um, more impacts to natural features, to open spaces, and to affordability are also considerations that need to be uh, taken into account. And um, while um, many people think that this will achieve what essentially is and which would, um, which are some wants, which is essentially a moratorium on development and population migration, etc. cetera. It, it's not the case. It's going to do uh, more harm than good. And um, while uh, I have two last comments, uh, this, this process feels to be fast-tracked. So I would just urge this commission and the government of Wilson County to take a little bit more time to study this and ask for uh, a lot more public input, not just in this forum, but uh, through stakeholder meetings and such. So that's all I have. Thank you. Respectfully, I will respond to the fast track. We, we've been discussing density in Wilson County pretty much since I got here, um, particularly with regard to the deferential uh, in, in one particular zone district being the R1 uh, back and forth. Um, I, while I agree with him that more spread out development does uh, result in longer road stretches that have to be maintained by county development, county uh, road commission and other agencies, uh, maybe harder for uh, lane and emergency services to get to and things like that that do cost additional money. I don't necessarily agree that out in the county that it's always wise to put more people out in a remote area of the county uh, where we don't have adequate infrastructure to serve them uh, just for their tax revenue. Uh, because we're just it's sort of a dog chasing its tail. Uh, there's also some wisdom for trying to encourage development where the infrastructure exists. There are some places in the county incorporated area that have better infrastructure than others, and I, it's my belief that our current land use plan is much better than <coughs> people have lodged at it. Uh, Take that again, Tom. Did, it's my belief that, that our current land use plan, as much criticism that people have lost, as people have lodged at it, has made attempts to centralize some of the areas that we're encouraging density versus those where we're not um, uh, for the purposes of, of trying to put them where we've got better infrastructure than not and also encouraging commercial development, which is where we actually do, as a county government, get ahead on tax revenues. 
but that being said, uh, there still remains this logic that uh, you want to encourage development where you have the best shot at serving. In this case, many times it is closer into our existing cities. Uh, not all of them. Again, we'll still have some areas out in the county that will encourage additional density. Uh, as we adopt a new land use plan, that'll certainly be a consideration going forward. Um, but given those points, along with sort of long standing ongoing negotiations about what the right density is for us, in conjunction with the extraordinary amount of growth that all of Middle Tennessee has seen, but in particular Wilson County in the past five to six years in particular, I think what you're finding is a constituency that's responding to our elected officials that they're just fatigued with growth. And while I may agree or disagree with some of the points on uh, adequate traffic flow and, and other things, it still doesn't change their perception. And, uh, I learned this in a marriage class a long time ago, someone's <laughs> perception is their reality. So. Uh, that's that's sort of where I relented and, and developed the ordinance at the request of several county commissioners. Anyone else wish to speak on this today? Mr. Luber. Yeah, I'm Chris Luber, the executive director of Water and Wastewater Authority of Wilson County. Um, my comments will be brief, or maybe others here want to comment. The zoning modifications as proposed will encourage the use of conventional septic systems maintained by individual homeowners, which when failed discharges untreated sewage in the homeowner's yard, versus existing zoning encourages developers to install publicly maintained wastewater collection and treatment facilities, presently step systems that we provide. We can provide other types of treatment technologies, but presently step systems, which treat the TDEC permit limits and discharges clean effluent into approved land application areas. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to address those. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity to comment. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak on this today? Yes, sir. Hello, I'm Frank Glenn. I noticed that I know almost everyone here with gray hair. I don't know what that says to me or you either one. I <laughs> need your color here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm here representing a group of professionals who work a lot with first-time homeowners. But in addition to that, this is an issue that on both sides is very near and dear to me. And I may push a little bit the limits of Mr. Jones's request, but I want to address these uh, issues. Uh, this proposal will work in that if you desire to reduce density in Wilson County it will accomplish that goal. What has not been addressed is at what cost and who will pay the cost of that. And that's what I want to address because I know most of you and I know your backgrounds and your family roots and that you care about your grandchildren and your nieces and nephews and the cost to them will be far greater than the cost to you. Uh, you all now know that developing 12 to 1500 square foot starter homes in this county is now non-existent. That doesn't occur. Not in the county, not in our own districts. Uh, now your starter home is closer to the 2500 square foot limit and the very best information available is that the new homes are running approximately $500,000 in Wilson County. Um, when you decrease or increase the lot requirements by 30 or 40 percent, there is going to be an increase in the cost of lots. I think that's common sense that we can all understand that. So the cost of the whole development has to be spread upon fewer lots. I think that's simple. And that's going to increase the cost of lots. But that is a fairly minor cost to be passed on. Because what happens when you get bigger lots and you get more expensive lots is they no longer build the smaller home that would have accommodated the less expensive lot. So as the lots get bigger, 
and more expensive. The size of the houses that, in most of our houses are built by track builders now, we, we know that. They're the ones who develop land. They are going to build bigger homes. From the very best and most accurate information I can get, this change alone will carry the average starting price for a home from a half million to between $625,000 and $750,000. And to follow my logic, you know, if you've got a more expensive lot, you build a more expensive home. And if it's a thousand square foot home at $200 a square foot, you can see how the prices <laughs> is going to go up exponentially. Um, and quite frankly, more than just creating a higher grade house, we may be creating Franklin and Williamson County that becomes a mecca for estate homes. Bigger lots, more aesthetically pleasing, and they could very well be the million to three million dollar homes that are there. And so I ask each of you to look at who bears the cost of that. It is not me. It is not Mr. Ricketts. It is not Mr. Jones or Mr. Ash. I know these gentlemen have farms and land as well as I do. And if I want to give my child a few acres to build a house, it's not going to matter. But as we get away from our family into extended family and the other family, and most of the families who are not so blessed in Wilson County, that is not going to be the case. Now, people who come here who sell homes in California and New York and New Jersey for two and three million dollars, it will not impact them at all. They will walk in here with a bankroll of three million dollars and be able to buy whatever house is on these more restrictive lots. But will your children be able to do that? Will your grandchildren be able to do that? Will your nieces and nephews be able to do that? So, where are they going to live? Well. I love my lifestyle. I mean, I, uh, my daddy said he worked himself to death, get off the farm. I worked myself to death, paid one to get back on. <laughs> uh, and I love it. And I want my children to have a yard. But the effect of this, the cost of this, could very well be I'm going to tell you where they can afford their homes in the cities multi family housing, condos lots as low as 3,000 square feet that they can do in the cities on sewer. That's where we will be putting our kids and our grandchildren and our nieces and nephews where there is affordable housing, not at the lifestyle that we want them to have. Because as the lots go up, the houses go up, and only outsiders probably selling from higher priced home areas may well be able to afford that. And this is the cost of this proposal. And the cost to me outweighs the aesthetic benefits. What do I mean by that? I got a nice farm. I got a nice house. I'll be honest. I'm not trying to hide that. And a bigger, nicer home built next door to me will look better. My neighbor will look better. But I'm not sure they're going to be better neighbors. <laughs> because I don't think they'll be your kids and my kids and our nieces and nephews. This will put, I talk, heard someone talking about how far the house was from the road. Well, drive to some of these places in the city where there will be affordable housing on 3,000 square foot lot. Now that's if they're lucky. Now that's a single family home on a 3,000 square foot lot. Most of them aren't going to be that way, all right? They're going to be condos and apartments. How close are they going to be to be playing in the street? That's what your affordable housing is going to look like for people from here who aren't selling houses in New York and New Jersey. You know, we... It makes sense. Lord, I'd love our county to be like it was. <laughs> but this is going to slow growth and destroy opportunities for the people that are already here. Where 15, 1,250 square foot starter homes in our one district where you have to develop or have been gone with this 2,500 square foot starter homes are going to be gone. And they are going to disappear and they're not going to have a yard. 
R1 already has limits on it. There's a limited amount of R1. You don't have to rezone more. I know you don't rezone it, but it probably goes to you someone else. We have things in place. Um, the people who work in this field, the people that I know, want you just to have the information of what the real cost is, of what sounds like a wonderful idea to have less density. I wish there was less density in my area. I'd buy more places to run cows, but I can't do it. But I do want my children and my grandchildren to live in Wilson County and not in the city. Uh, and it is that information that we ask you to consider the cost of lower density because it's real. These numbers are real. And uh, we're pricing us out and pricing insiders in. Thank you very much. I'll answer any questions you have any, but I doubt that's the case. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> My name is John Sheely. I'm the Executive Vice President for the Home Builders Association of Middle Tennessee. In the interest of brevity, uh, we're just going to endorse everything the previous speaker said. Uh, <laughs> I, will, I will add one caveat that's going on in our industry. Our children and grandchildren may very well live in a single family home, but they'll be renting it. And that's happening now from the driving prices up, investors are coming and buying entire neighborhoods. <coughs> so unless we can start producing uh, single family homes that are affordable to median income families, this is what we're, this is the legacy we're leaving our children. Thank you, sir. Mr. Sheehan. Uh -oh. uh oh. How do you propose that we control who buys up those properties and, oh, and, and develops some low density just for sale instead of rental because well, we cannot do, we cannot control that the way you control it is, the, the way you control it is through quantity is through just simply having this was not a problem if you go back 30 years my first house 1900 square feet a little over a fifth of an acre uh vinyl on all four sides uh front entry garage it was one hundred nineteen thousand dollars. median income back then was forty eight thousand now median income median income is sixty thousand and our, our median home price is somewhere shy of 300. So the, the investors see this. They see people cannot afford to qualify for these homes. So they're buying them and renting them. And that's, you know, as far as controlling the transaction, you can't. But you can control the supply. And that's what's been limited through good intention, you know, ordinances. But that's exactly what's happening everywhere. Yeah. My question back to, to you would be, you can provide more supply but there's nothing to keep those investors from buying those up as well, which is what we perceive to be happening. There's always going to be a tipping point where all of a sudden investors say, I can't make a return on my investment. Right now, they can make a return on their investment. People are willing to rent these houses because they don't want to live in a, in a town. You know, they want to have a yard where they throw the ball. So it, it, it's, I just want to, it's not just Wilson County. <laughs> Everywhere this is going on. But we've got to start you know, looking at that. So how can we produce affordable housing, housing affordable to median income buyers like we did 30 years ago. And the only real difference is the regulatory environment that developers face in trying to get a large project approved. May I ask, may I ask you a question, Mr. Trash? Yes, sir, Mr. Trash. Tell me your name again. John. I'm calling you John. Terry. Okay. <laughs> and you represent the Builders Association? Yes, sir. What kind of impact do you think you have on the, the lay people who work in, in this industry? Is this going to cause some of them, can't build as many houses so you, you don't need as many electricians, you don't need as many plumbers. I mean, this thing has unintended consequences. Am I right or wrong? Well, uh, you know, every regulation has unintended consequences, and that is one of them as well. I think uh, I would use an example uh, of another county, Cheatham County, many years ago, passed a very large privilege tax. And what they basically did is wiped out their, their homegrown building industry, their, their, their lumber yards, their builders, their developers, and all the subs. And so, yeah, when you, when, I, I'm reluctant to say that overall, throughout all of Middle Tennessee, and I think this is something we agree with planners on, there's gonna be a certain number of homes built regardless of the regulation, it's a question of who owns them and where are they. And I think the where are they 
is what he's hitting on is, are we going to be a sea of rooftops all the way through Wilson County? When I say sea of rooftop, rooftops, a rooftop every 400 yards, 800 yards, you know, or are we going to allow density where it needs to be? So that's, that's what we're doing. I don't know if that answers your question. No, I'm just thinking about sales tax revenue from, I buy my life fake and hooker, I don't care who knows. <laughs> Thank you. But they, they'll they sell less building packages, and that'll be less sales tax revenue. I'm, I'm just... I wish I'd known that's what you're going for, because, uh, yeah, that, what we deal with is people say, well, you know, we build this house and it pays so little in property tax, and they, they just completely forget about sales tax where that is a huge multiplier of every house. And we all say, well, we sure would like this retail place to move in uh, because they're going to pay a sales tax when, in reality, the retail place is moving in because of the residential that's right there next to it. So we also have an adequate facilities tax. Not much. And that's going to cut the revenue on that. Yes, it will. But it, it'll hit your sales tax harder. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I do have housing start numbers for the last four fiscal years and last four fiscal years and seven months. The last four fiscal years um, in the Wilson County Unincorporated area, we had 1,587 homes uh, that were started. Brand new homes, not replacements or anything else. Uh, and that would be any type of unit, duplex, uh, manufactured home, anything else. That accounts for 14.9% of all housing starts in Wilson County over the last four fiscal years. Over the last four fiscal years and seven months, that number has dropped to 14.6% uh, with 1,790 homes in the Wilson County Unincorporated area. Um, we did recently consider at the County Commission, at least at the County Commission, not we, but the County Commission did consider doubling our adequate facilities tax for a period of time for the residential growth. They opted not to do that had they done that, that would have affected 100% of our growth. What this ordinance does affects roughly 12 to 15%. What I was going to tell you is in the last uh, seven months, just this fiscal year, our growth accounts in this fiscal year for approximately 12.4%, or 508, uh, wait a minute, 203 housing units that have started since July 1st of 2022. So, I mean, we're, we're accounting for between 12 and 15 percent of the growth, and it's impacting between 12 and 15 percent of the growth we're seeing with this particular amendment, as opposed to an adequate facilities tax increase, which would have affected 100 percent of the growth. So I feel like this is a measured response. Okay. Thank you, sir. We have anyone one else? Wish yes, sir. you all for your time today. I did not come here planning to speak. <laughs> um, my name is Joey Wallace. Um, I work with a company called Achiever Development. We are a local developer um, here based in Middle Tennessee. And like I said, I plan to sit back and listen. <clears throat> but many of the comments um, impact me personally as I am um, younger uh, here in this room. And I think from hearing some of the comments, I um, felt that myself personally wanted to speak on behalf um, I reside in Sumner County in Hendersonville, uh, born and raised here in Middle Tennessee. And what you all are discussing today is something that my wife and I are struggling with right now ourselves, um, trying to find a place. I grew up on five acres, desire five acres. Um, would love to have that for my kids, but it has become, um, we look today, a, a two and a half acre lot in Sumner County is uh, $485,000. Mm -hmm. um, and they're selling very quickly. Um, the, the, the monthly payment on that with a 20% 20, uh, 20 down and a 20 year loan is roughly $3,000 a month. I myself cannot afford that um, for simply land. And so um, I speak to you today uh, from a development side, I, I do see both sides of it. Um, we love more density, but we also love larger lots. Um, those are fantastic for, for the community. But also, you know, ask that this is something that's being proposed in Sumner County as well. Uh, there's kind of rumblings of the same thing going around. Um, and I ask as a, as a resident of Middle Tennessee that you all strongly consider what you're, what you're looking at doing um, to people like myself who have moved back home um, and are trying to buy a home. I, I now, I'd be thrilled to find a, uh, 
a half acre or even an acre lot to build a home on. Um, and, and I think what the proposal here is going to make it extremely hard for me to find that. Um, which, like was said, pushing me into the city limits um, and, and pulling back on that. So thank you all for your time today. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, I will say you've heard that at least twice now from Mr. Lanham and, and this young man. Um, I have two children as well that grew up here in Wilson County. I'd love nothing more for them to come back at least somewhere nearby and be able to afford a house uh, with whatever family they create. Um, they're, they're both either in college or about to start college. So I, I, I think of all the arguments, that's probably the most poignant, and that's something I have brought up at the Planning and Zoning Committee as well as with the commissioners that have discussed this with me. In fact, the last time we considered any density increase or density decrease uh, was, I don't know, 2006 or seven, maybe 2008 time period. Uh, my memory gets fuzzy. Uh, but uh, that was brought up then as well, is the young people being able to afford a place. And uh, I do think that is a noteworthy discussion to have. And, we, and I also think it's noteworthy to, to consider that our growth projections, both regionally and for Wilson County, are significant in terms of what Woods and Pool and others project that we're going to grow to as a county, and that includes the city. Um, what I have resolved, though, in my own mind, at a personal level, is that if my kids come back here, they're probably going to have to start out in a villa or a town home. Uh, and I started out even renting myself when I started out uh, until I was able to afford a uh, subsidized loan to get into my first house. Um, you know, I think they'll have to follow the same uh, track. They may just have to start with a different type of housing product than, than I started with, which is, again, kind of me and fill out Tom, Tom, may I ask Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Um, Thompson. Um, as a volunteer on the Planning Commission, I see both sides of this, but it's relatively new. It's new information for me. And uh, I'm not comfortable making a decision on that as it is now, without, with the little information that I have, and I don't know about anybody else. But is there, I think, don't we need more public input for well, people that will may be, have There will be a public, uh, public hearing at the county commission. Mm -hmm. um, I will point out, and I think the attorney may agree with me on this, you, you, You've got to vote it up or down, or you can vote to defer it for a period of time. However, if you defer it, I'm going to ask that you not accept uh, residential subdivision flats in that interim because we will get absolutely inundated uh, with residential subdivision flats while y'all are trying to make up your, uh, y'all and the county commission respectively. I think, I think that's appropriate. I think this, the, um, the depth of this demands that time. Well, before we get going on that, because we had a motion last time, and most of my colleagues know my feelings on, and I've used the term sprawl, and I respect these people that have larger lots and farms, but the last two meetings, this room has been filled by people that have stood at this podium and talked against density right beside them. And you guys should have been here for those two meetings. And the commissioners that stood for them and said, I've got three quarters of an acre. I've got an acre and a half and they're going to put 55 homes on 0.2 acres next to me. I'm exaggerating. Okay. <laughs> but this is what's going on. And there's no, there's two things we can't control. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to start preaching here, I guess. Uh, I can't dictate to investors and I certainly can't control people who come in here cash heavy because we, even an older guy, have to fight that. You sell a home for a million dollars, that's a thousand square feet in California and come down here, I can't compete with you. It's not going to happen. I don't care what we do and how we vote or what we say. You're not going to change that because when they walk in here and say, that's a pretty land. I like her house. I want to live next to her. And boom, they do it. How many times have you gone to buy a house? And some of you in here probably have done it. And you say, I like it. I'm going to bid on it. Somebody comes in $30,000 over asking price. You're not going to get that. I'm not going to do that. This is what we're hearing, and this is what Tom has been hearing. And these people are coming in worried about what they've done because they've been here 30, 40, 50 years even so far, up north on 231. Big thing going on up there. And we've been hearing this. So I see, Tom, a couple of comments. You were very conservative in the A2, A1 area. I mean, we, we increased 
from 130 to 174,000. But in residential, we dropped it down from 43 to 40. So it's not quite as conservative. Am I not seeing that? 43,000, 560, and no public down to 40,000? Yeah, that, that's just making it across the board 40,000 square foot. Long. Sure, I mean, you, you, you but, unitize but that's, it. That's a minor. But what you're talking about is if you've got a lot that has no public water. You're exactly. Exactly. Square just there's for clarity. Just, there's just not a lot that, that's out there that have that. It would have to be on well water. There are some way out in the hinterland. So really the, the percentages yeah. then on page three, I think. Um, when the builder stepped up, he added the two together, which was maximum overall single family in existence, 174.26, were added together uh, when he wanted to have high density, and it dropped 109 and 0.35 uh, in the proposed criteria. And you would consider that more conservative? Yes? I'm sorry. Agriculture, let's look at... Um, a1, for example. Mr. Renfro, the way that you're looking at that, it is more conservative. It's currently, if he tanked today, he would be able, he would be allowed under the PUD to get two units per acre. If this is adopted under the PUD, he's going to be allowed to have 1.44 units per acre. Wanted to clarify that. That's what we've been hearing from the public. Meeting after meeting after meeting. So, Tom, I hear you. I see what you're saying. I don't mind a deferral, and I hear what my colleagues say. But I think this is what the community has been looking for. Well, and, and as follow-up, talking about uh, measured responses, there are, there are, I think it's been mentioned, there are other counties that are either have considered or are considering similar <coughs> county jurisdictions that are considering similar uh, uh, actions. Uh, to that point, it's not my understanding Williamson County has increased theirs to four or five acre minimums uh, across the unincorporated area of the county. Again, we're not proposing to go to four or five acres, in part because if you get above five <coughs> acres, again, due to state law, as was mentioned by one of the speakers, um, we don't have a lot of control beyond five acres. So I don't see a lot of wisdom in, in going to five acre minimums across the board because we have no control at that point, or, or very little. In um, contrast, state though. Law. Yes, so again, in addition to the percentages of growth that we account for, historically, at least in recent history, um, in the unincorporated areas. Um, I feel like this is a measured response in terms of what type of density increases we're talking about from top to bottom. Um, the, I do have, this includes Watertown, because we do a lot of their planning anyways, but countywide, we believe we have around 62,957 parcels. That's inside and outside the cities. That would include commercial as well, just to compare this. Outside oh, of cities? It, no. Inside and out. Inside and outside. We've got 62,967 dollars. Um, we've got 33,459 unincorporated parcels or parcels that are in the city of Watertown. Um, um, and then we have a roughly of the ones that are currently that we've developed at acre or less subdivision density or acre or less lot density, uh, we've got 13,470 parcels according to the tax records we've got available in our GIS system. Across all uh, zones? Across, uh, in, not in the city of London, not in the city of Mount Julian. Watertown and unincorporated areas. We've got 13,470 <coughs> of the 33,459 total parcels in the unincorporated area, including water. Tom, did the planning and zoning committee get a chance to hear all, all this in detail like they that? Heard, they, heard, uh, they heard about the growth numbers that I gave you with regard to the percentages. They also, they did not hear about this. We just, I think Mr. Turner uh, had called me asking some questions about the amendment. And one of the questions he asked was how many parcels are under an acre. And so I only had to try to compile that on quick numbers. But you don't know how many are under an acre in A1, though, do you? I can find that out. No, I don't have that number today. Tom. Uh, 40,000. What I, I'm not interested. We will have a public hearing, obviously. Well, you what, have a public hearing today, but you'll Yeah, what I'd public. like to see is a work session by this panel. If we want to call somebody to discuss this with us, that would be fine. I didn't know whether that would be legal from a legal stance. To, uh, control that meeting a little bit to our preferences of who we want to talk to specialists in the field in the area to get the all the nuances 
And then if you want to have a public hearing more like we're having today, that's fine too. But that's the thing that I would like to see us do here. May I make some comments too? Sure. I'm not as uh, eloquent as uh, the counselor back there or as substantive as the, my colleague here, but I got a few little things I want to Well, I've got two Go more ahead. to finish and then Go I'm ahead. done. Uh, two key points, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one is, as an engineer, we've heard the old adage that glass is half full, that glass is half empty. What I say is that you designed it wrong. It's simple. <laughs> Another thing too, and I look through this community and I see most, and I know most of you, and develop, developers and builders and real estate agents, you have a heart, and we're not talking about that, people haven't mentioned that, for your neighbor, because you live here, you've been here, but there's nothing we can control when those California builders and New York builders and Atlanta builders all show up and say, I'm going to maximize my return, and I'm going to put everything I can on this lot, including birdhouses. I'm moving everybody in. You can't control that. We can't vote that out. There's no legal precedent to tell us we can do that. So you've got all this outside influence coming in. I trust some of these builders. I've worked with some of them. They're good people. And when somebody says next door, this kind of bothers me, or you're a little too close, or you're not uh, taking into consideration, you know what? They listen, and they work together. A lot of these builders will do that. But the ones that are from out of town, they won't do that. So you've got to consider that, too when you start talking about this. I appreciate what Tom's gone through, but I also appreciate what my colleague said is, maybe there's not enough time to decide this because I've only had a day to look this over from an email last night. And I'm going, there's a lot of numbers here. I can do the math, but are we going in the right direction? I trust Tom. And if we were forced to make that decision today, I think everybody knows where I would go. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, you brought up some good points there. I think there's a philosophy and overview here we have to establish and then you got to punch in the numbers to see how it flies. The other thing about that, there is no perfect to solution to this. There is no. You go in any direction here and you're going to find something is not right. It's just the way things are. But I, I wanted to make a couple of comments and struggle with me a little bit because I'm not as good as the other two guys are presenting this. I see the thing that is primarily the most important thing, and Tom, correct me here, is uh, a proposal or a, this is a tool to control growth. Would you not agree with that, Tom? It's a tool to direct densities. That's controlling growth. Uh, within 15% given permit history of okay. the county. So we're interested in controlling growth. Now the cities are also involved in this. They're interested in growth, but more importantly, where the growth goes. And so we've got a twofold issue. We're concerned about growth overall. They're concerned in a more concentrated thinking of where is it going? And that brings a nuance to all of this that you have to consider and be cautious in how you work with them on things. Growth's hard to stop, high pressure on both sides for it and against it. Uh, we may think we are a rural county, and that's not totally so. We are not a city, but the demand for city services is pushed on us for several years, and it's growing. Sheriff's office, chief of police, fire and ambulance, WEMA, Lebanon Fire. We have been around with uh, city street departments in the cities. We have a road commission. Wilson County has a school system. The city has a school system. And a new effect, a wrinkle that really tightened this race, a water and wastewater authority. And now we got a sewer system as well. We got all the components. We've even gone so far as to call our county executive a mayor now. <laughs> Getting pretty close, aren't we? <laughs> Got to be extremely careful and realize what we are. We are not a rural area anymore. From Statesville to Hermitage, it's changing. A little denser, a little thicker, a little higher, a little taller, but it's all the same game that's going on. We have a very strong water and wastewater, and I'm, please bear with me, it sounds like I'm going to be rambling here. We have a very strong wastewater program, and uh, uh, 
Brother Luber back here is a very good manager. I've known Chris a good while and he knows his business. A very impressive board out there. Jeff Joins is on it. I know Jeff and I know many of the others. They're legal counsels. They've been around the block. I respect them. I feel like they know what they are doing out there. Um, and so we find ourselves in that, in that particular situation. That leads me to the thinking of, you know, in the 80s, uh, I was on this board. <laughs> and the, we, had, we, had, we had crowds like this all the time. What was the argument? Oh, we don't want septic tanks. It'll be sewer in our ditches. It'll be cesspools in our yards. It's been our streams. My wells are going to be ruined. And the developers sitting on the back row, we got a bill, we got a bill, we got a bill, we got a bill. Same game. All of a sudden, the state does something wonderful. They call a step system a legal, certified, public sewer system. And with the agency that I just described to you and its strength and its expertise, we're in business here. This thing changed overnight. The growth expanded in here. Things were relaxed. People went along with the technicals of it, and it worked fine. I don't want to lose that. I don't like what I see in that regulation in regard to the possibility of septic tanks rearing their heads again. Now, I'm not opposed to septic tanks. They're needed. In fact, the step system utilizes the septic tank. It manages it and keeps it working like it ought to. Even to the point if the silage in your septic tank get in there, they pump it under the regulations they've got to follow. That is strong as any sewer system a city sewer system could be. We've got it, people, and I don't want to lose that. And I don't want to see these septic tanks work back in the back door on us. And the way I read this, and the way the hint has been all the way around here, that potential possibility is there. Is there. I'm going to be opposed to this, if nothing else, from losing that. Losing that as we develop and grow. Our water and sewer system, our program here in the county, I talked to our director back there. Uh, what's the name of this case study, Chris? The, that's from the Water Research Foundation, looking at decentralized systems and treatment processes throughout a, um, the Columbia University, Columbia Water Center is involved in that research project. Very sophisticated. Yes. Wide range. They're going to do some case studies, nationwide, international. Austin, Texas is in that. Denver, Colorado. Vancouver, British Columbia the Twin Cities region. And down at the bottom of that list of five, Wilson County, Tennessee. I don't, some don't come be coming here a jack leg and tell me they don't know what they're doing. Don't you tell me that. I won't listen to you. Okay. GRC. The regional, greater regional council Governments, isn't that correct, Chris? Better national. Better out. Thank you. <laughs> Suggs Creek Watershed based plan a full report. They made this report. Didn't they? One of the things they say over the here is we must make every intention to rid ourselves of septic tanks. Septic. growth. I don't want this county robbed of growth area. I want to cooperate and work with cities in every way. Lebanon. Their growth, recommended growth line,
corresponds to the water authority's water service area as well as their wastewater service area. That's good. We know where we can go, they know where they can go. Oh, but you're crimping the cities. Do you know how we talked about intensity in those houses? My son lives in Allen, Texas, of uh, a Dallas suburb, 30 feet between a half a million dollar house. That's a city. We're nowhere near that. Nowhere near that. They know where they can go. The water authorities line of uh, their service area with Mount Judah is an agreed upon line. Funny they can't get an agreement with them over that sewer line. Why? Why? They want the area for growth. Now I don't want to get in a war here over jurisdiction. But when I see the massive organization this county has already got in place for being operated almost like a city, just to roll over, well, you can take that, well, you can have that. Don't give me that. Don't give me that. And this particular plan, well, it might, it might do that. I've got one other point I want to make. What's the solution? We've got to do something. We talk about controlling growth. What have we got to control growth? What are we doing to control growth? Ever heard of an impact fee? Works, uniforms, across the board. You know what you're going to do when you start this business of jack-legging your rules and regulations? We'll tweak a little here, and we'll tweak a little over here, and one of these days we wake up and we've got such a hodgepodge of jungle of regulations we want to know where the hell we are. We don't need that. We need a good, uniform way to, hot, to handle this. You could make a special impact fee for the folks at Lima. They need it. This man, this man, and this man know that firsthand. There are all kinds of ways you can handle that. It's already in place. It works. It generates lots of money. Raise the thing. Don't jack leg the sizes of the lots. Raise the thing. That's my feeling, that what we should be doing rather than this solution right here. We've already got it in place and it works. We need to realize what we are. We are that close to being a city. What's the square miles of Wilson County? 584 including water, I believe. Pretty big almost city, isn't it? Oh, well, I got the exact number. <laughs> That's close enough, Tom. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll live with that. And I, Tom does an unbelievable job. This thing is, is, is to a we're, at a, we're at a real turning point. We, we really got to pay attention in this county the next few years. And that means this board is not going to make everybody happy. Can't. Impossible. Impossible. I think about a lot the greatest good for all. What does that mean? Doesn't necessarily mean a 25 home community down here. It means for everybody in that square mileage he just quoted, our taxes, our schools, our roads, we have to do what's right for the entire area. And it's massive and growing by leaps and bounds. Growing by leaps and bounds. So, the solution is the impact fee. Don't let source, don't let anybody for one minute try to bring septic tanks and damage the incredible progress these people have made and the, the, the respect they have nationwide. Nationwide. That's all I have. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I thank you, sir. One more point with a question to Mr. Luber. Um, am I to assume then from my colleagues emotional desk pounding <laughs> that uh, large lots require uh, septic systems and you would not service them with a step system and run another hundred feet of a line? Or will a step system work in larger lots? The, the, the technology will work fine. It's just uh, a cost factor. If you talk to the developers to build step systems are going to be more cost per lot versus going on a septic system. Which is another way to get revenue to the, from the developers anyway. 
but is not prohibitive to have no. a larger lot and a step system. Is that correct? That is correct. You're just going to run the lot size up and cost, and they won't put off on it. I didn't make a statement earlier. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Um, I'm voting for this. He said he's voting against it, but I think I'm for it. That's all my. If we could, I want to get back to the public comment. These people have taken their time to be here. If anybody else wants to speak on this and hadn't spoke yet, sir. Yeah, but I'm sorry. Well, again, Randy Sexton, the landmark on one of the things that Tom brought up is the fact that there are 62,000 and some odd parcels. Not all of that property can be developed, and I can speak to that. I look at probably, I'm the land manager for our company in charge of acquisition and development. I probably look at no less than 50 parcels per month on an average, turn, turn the majority of them down, just because of the fact that either the soils are bad, the water and sewer availability isn't there, or it's just in an area that's not ready for development. I've actually sat with Chris, and we've talked at length on countless times about different parcels. I've sent emails to Tom and Chris, as a matter of fact, and asked them the same thing. What can we do here? What's the maximum density? There was an 80-acre parcel, just as an example, that I wanted to develop, and Chris can confirm this. The water is to the property, but the problem is the pressure isn't there. So that's one parcel. There are countless parcels like that throughout Wilson County that they will not be developed anytime soon. If you subtract those out of the 62 some odd thousand, I, would hesitate, I wouldn't hesitate to guess there's probably half of that that can be developed at some point in time. Take out Watertown, take out Lebanon, take out Mount Juliet. Now you're down to a few thousand parcels that can be developed. Don't lose sight of the fact that that's your revenue growth for the future. Now, if you, I don't want to use the word, if you destroy that by creating the sprawl and burn through that acreage, faster by creating these larger lots, you're cutting your nose off in spite of your face and losing future revenue. Less density isn't the problem. Again, it, it's, that's, that just drives the cost up as we've heard and as I can tell you, our average home cost this year will be well over $500,000, approaching $600,000. That's not a first time home buyer product. So, Again, fees, yes, increase the fees. That can be passed along to the, to the end user. You were talking about uh, what's to keep investors from coming in and buying uh, yes. all these communities. In our homeowners association documents, we limit the amount of uh, units that investors can buy to 10 to 15% that can be rented. When we reach that maximum, if you have a piece, if you're an owner and you want to rent, you have to wait. You have to wait until somebody else isn't using the rent. We control with property management. There are there are ways to keep pro keep the homes affordable. And but it, it would be my position that we cannot require that as a government. If you choose to do that, that's your business. But Tom, that's not, it, it's not something we're asking you to require. We're volunteering to do that because we know from our standpoint that it's going to create problems for us as well if, again, if companies come in and burn through all the usable acreage and there's nothing left for us. We're a home building company that's been here for 32 years. We don't want to be forced out of the market because we're out of property or because we have to, instead of driving 20 minutes from our office, we have to go an hour, hour and a half to develop a piece of property in Bedford County or someplace else. That's just not, it's not who we are. And, and we would ask you to, to consider the fact that density controls, look at what your available properties are that can be developed before you consider the fact that it's 62,000. That number is considerably less. Thank you. That's the kind of things he's talking about as a, in a work session we need to hear. A work session with limited numbers of people, you and I, we decide to come in here and talk to us. 
And then we, if we want to present based on that to the general public in hearings, that's great. If you wish to have a work session, I have no problem with okay. that. I suggest that you would want the Planning and Zoning Committee, yeah. any commissioners that wish to come. At sure. Home. They want uh, to come. I would also suggest that in the interim that we uh, restrict new subdivision flat submittals. Now, if we've got one that's already in the hopper in the process, I'm perfectly happy going ahead and processing those to the Planning Commission uh, because those are going to be grandfathered. Yes. So why would we do that, Tom? Why would we restrict it while we're doing it? Because we're going to get piled on with uh, unnecessary subdivision flats and middles for people trying to secure a place in uh, life. zoning in time. Mike, yeah. yeah. would you like to speak to that? Well, once they do that, once you act on it, then they have vested rights and you can't go back. And, and once they submit it, in my opinion, yeah. they have. So you just have a moratorium and we have to expedite to keep it from getting yeah. out of hand. Don't yes. make a very long moratorium because there are a whole lot of factors here. One of which is adequate facility taxes and things that support the building of our schools and jail and that type of thing. Whatever decision you're going to make, make it pretty quick. I'm not lobbying either do, way. Do you think it's ill advisable to have a work session structured no, like that? I don't, but I don't. I think this ought to be knocked out in the next 30 minutes. Right. So uh, we're, we've gone all the way around here, but we hadn't talked about the farmer and the homeowner who invested all of his time in life and now wants to sell his property. Yep. And, and I'm, I'm very concerned that we protect the rights of those people. And there's some of them in this room here right now that just, that's got large tracts of land that haven't sold them yet, and I know they're concerned about this, and and, and I am too on that, on that part of it. There's some in this room that have large tracts of, it, tracts of land, probably far of this. As the <coughs> preacher here said, uh, <laughs> which his daddy said to me, his daddy was my preacher. I guess y'all can tell that. Uh, this, this needs some follow. This, that's why I asked you, Tom, Tom, did the committee have a chance to hear this much input? Because I looked at the minutes. The, the meeting lasted an hour and 32 minutes. And it was the last thing brought up. And y'all had had a whole lot of conversation about a whole lot of other stuff. How much time was spent, in fairness to that committee, I served on it at one time. How much time was put into this, or was it just all the years of conversation that kind of led to that? I think, I think it was the last 32 minutes, but the, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it was the absolute last thing that was heard. I, I, my recollection is a little fuzzy, but I was thinking that the budget hearings were the last thing. That's right. Anyways, That's right. Um, that all being said, uh, it was probably a, a litany of conversation that's occurred over a number of years, both in that committee and outside of that committee. And if, I was, Commissioner. And if I was sitting back over here right now, which I'm well, not, <laughs> uh, they're in the mid middle of the budget process. You know, they got a lot on their plate. This is an unknown out here to some degree. Um, I, I just, and I, I'm not going to tell you guys, I ain't too smart. I'm sitting here trying to figure out some of this on the fly. Mm -hmm. I'm just telling you the truth. If you think I am, you've overestimated my ability to be educated. <laughs> no, no, no. But <coughs> I, it's got to be looked at, and it's got to be looked at in depth. I don't know how we do it. I don't know how, what, how the committee here would like to proceed with it. I think variations of conversations. I've got more phone calls about this than I did the entire last year I was on the county commission. Wow. From different people, um, both sides. So um, I don't it, know how to go forward. I'm going to take some wisdom from somebody how to move this thing forward. This sets the pace for what this community is. This county is going to do growth-wise, I feel like, what we do here will set the pace for what we do for the next 15, 20 years. Mr. Chairman, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Please. How come this isn't a, a, a product of the, or a part of the land use plan? It may very well have been, but the land use plan is held up I mean, up hasn't it come back up in conversation? It's, the it's held, no, it's held up indefinitely because of the growth plan. How, how, how does that happen? happen? I'm sorry, I didn't mean plan. to interrupt you. Uh, we yeah. had our public input meetings on the on the land use plan, and again, this is a product of what we heard knows as well uh, from the public lab of clear, uh, that they were effectively growth uh, and wanted to see us do something to address growth, particularly in regards to different infrastructure. And I'm not just talking about water and sewer, I'm talking about roads, schools, mm -hmm. fire, whatever, uh, under conditions of growth, things like that. The, uh, it got held up because Mount Juliet is proposing a planning region and growth boundary that extends to the county line. 
And as one of their policy requests, they were asking that we go to acre minimum lot in their planning region, whatever it may end up being. And I, from my perspective, I'm not going to do that within one planning region. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to, I'm going to amend the ordinance to where it's fair and not arbitrary. Mr. Chairman, may I say something? Yes, sir, if you would come forward, Mr. Ag. My name is Jim Agee. I think the majority of the, you know, you, on this moratorium thing, I mean, I'm, I've had two, we had two plats before you this morning where I'm, we're working with homeowners and most of them are on the states here in Wilson County. <coughs> And we've got a half a dozen more that we're going to be presenting to the commission. And I would respectfully ask you not to put a moratorium because these are states. These are things we have planned to sell. And I mean, they're not 100 lot subdivisions. You know, they're, they're five, 10 at the most. You know, it might be some 10, 12, but you know, just not put a moratorium to, to slow this process down with what we have working and and all these people are you know they've owned these farms for years yes sir but i respectfully ask that thank you sir. i would respectfully request if that's your position as a, as a board that you voted up for that because it will it will cause us uh let me ask cause you tom i hear i hear what you're saying but you your position that you're going to be inundated in the next 30 days doesn't seem completely reasonable to me because people would have to have things paper ready right now to meet your two week. They've got to have stuff in within two weeks from today to be on the next month's agenda. I can't imagine that you would be inundated in the next two weeks. Now, you correct me if I'm wrong, but that would be my the way I would look at that. And I understand why you no, don't want to stack a class sure that we can get the workshop done in 30 days. Uh, I think it may take somewhere more akin to 60 days to get it to a workshop and to the county commission with a recommendation one way or the other from this board. Number two, I, you might be surprised. Tom, do we have a bring something in on the back? Of I could be wrong. I just don't see yeah. that happening. We've, two weeks. we've got on the 21st. We have. <coughs> we start an hour early. With, uh, but I guess you got that agenda pretty well timed up. There. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any, any anyone else from the public wishing to speak on this case? Yes, sir, Mr. Winchester. Uh, my name is Luke Winchester. Know many of you guys out here. If um, this is an interesting plot. <laughs> um, may I suggest? You know, I, I agree. Here, you guys on both sides of the fence, and obviously I'm kind of on both sides of the fence as well. And uh, and what I do. But maybe take action on your item in order to press your item forward. I believe it's a recommendation item back to your uh, to your commissioners, if I'm not mistaken. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. The committee. But, but at least it gets uh, your recommendation, allows your project to move forward right there. Maybe make it subject to your workshop uh, uh, comments. And workshop does have its inherent value out there from the public and whatnot. But the only comment that I was going to share with that is that if you choose to conduct your workshop, Maybe you invite uh, your municipality leaders from both the City of Levin, City of Watertown, and City of Mount Juliet as well, uh, because what you're proposing up here is a lot of what we see in the city municipalities, and you're just not seeing it in the county right now. So they might be to shed some advice and some opinions uh, to each of you all so that you make the best informative decision of what's best for all of us. And Luke, that's why I asked how much time went into this before we got here. Yeah. This is a very, very sensitive issue. People of both sides. Yes, sir. And nobody's worked harder at trying to do what's right than Tom. If I was doing a PUD, he'd be, that'd be my guy right over there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But this is, this is really complicated. And, and you, you just can't do it in a 10 minute session or a 30 minute session because there's too many variables out there, too many unintended consequences. And everybody's not going to be happy at the end. Yes. Sir. But, I don't want anybody to say we didn't do due diligence yes. and yes. try to find the right answer when we finally make a recommendation or maybe not recommend a recommendation to the county commission. Yes. May send it on to the county commission with no recommendation yes. and let them decide. 
And, and then you know, Mr. Bashir mentioned our UGB meeting for the city of Mount Hewitt. That's actually, uh, we have a meeting coming up, I believe, at 5 o'clock uh, on the 27th. At, but, uh, but, I don't, but I don't want five other people sitting in here <laughs> putting pressure on them. I, I've sat yeah. over there. That's not fair to them. But this is going to happen, I think, here regardless. But we've got to make an informed decision here. And right now, see, I have all the knowledge I need and the tools at my disposal to make that. That's why I thought that it might be beneficial to ask uh, your municipality leaders to attend that workshop if you so choose to do that direction. You can't stop the growth. All you can do is bend it. <laughs> Look, I do have one question. I'm yes. not trying to belabor the meeting. Does that mean you're talking about on the 27th? Is that a city meeting or is that the urban growth meeting? Because I've not been told you have a Work session. With a city work session? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, yeah, open to the public uh, likewise. Right. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Do we have anyone else wishing to speak on this case today? This time we'll close the public comment session and I'd ask for any comments or questions from the board. Any additional comments from the board? I have a question of how long it can be deferred and how many times it can be deferred. Uh, it, it'll go to the county commission regardless. Well, with all due respect to Tom, I think we need to be uh, conscious of what this could potentially do to his office mm -hmm. uh, long term. I don't know that we have to act on it, period, because it's just something that's been brought before us by the Planning and Zoning Committee, not by an individual. Uh, I don't know that there is a the, the restrictive state, timeline here There's not a officially. restrictive timeline per se, but the County Commission at some point can bring it up to mm -hmm. the floor with as long as there's public hearing that tries that. Uh, well, maybe that's what we all let happen. Mm. They're going to it anyway. There, there's a course to consider a recommendation as a body on any zoning. Agenda. So if it, it goes forward, but if it goes forward to them with no recommendation, what happens? Okay. If you vote to forward it with no recommendation, I suppose that's what we'll take. Okay. We do have a job to try to make well, a good effort to make a we recommendation. We're panel to do what's right and study this, I think. You want a workshop? I don't saying. know. I'm just, I'm just talking out loud. And everybody else is here. You got the chairman of the committee right here well, he's with his that. calendar out. <laughs> Jerry, would you like to speak to this at all, Mr. McCarnell? If you want a workshop, I should call a workshop. Set it. a date yeah. and call it. <laughs> Tell them it's mandatory or they got to be there or something. Swing in there. Huh. I don't think you can make No, you can't. I don't know that we can either. make it mandatory, but uh, we, can, no. we can devise it. Have better food, we'll get better turnout. With the add <laughs> on of a moratorium for They want you to have a cookout. Oh, good. <laughs> <That's laughs> I mean, that sounds such a busy one. Well, let's, don't, let's jump in and say we're going to have one. The deal still needs to be some thought process to who would be in that thing. And again, everybody's not going to be agreeable. You have to control the time mm -hmm. on it. I mean, there's a lot, puts a lot of pressure on you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> but still, a lot of thought has to go into what kind of workshop you have, where you have it at, who's going to be in it. And then after the workshop, I assume we would let the public come in and make their public comments about it. I still don't at well, the workshop, I don't ever want to shut the public out. I at, the the workshop, I don't at the workshop, I wouldn't take it. No, no. I would, I, the workshop's not the place to have public no, comments. No, 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 no. Well, there's another public hearing that would have to be scheduled for the county commission. Correct. Yes. Or if you wish for it to come back here, we could have to have another public hearing. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's not make it complicated. Uh, can we set a time stamp, say within two weeks or three? Well, I will tell you this. I have a personal matter. Um, March 31st through the first week of April that I likely will not be able to. And I do too. And it's not a vacation. No, I ain't either. <laughs> Okay, we have any other questions from our board? This time I'll call for a motion. I'll make the motion that we approve the um, amendment that's been presented to us. Second. We have a motion from Ms. Nicholson, a second by Mr. Renfro to approve it. All those in favor of it, or if you would please raise your right hand. We have two votes to approve. All those opposed, raise your right hand, please. We have eight votes against. That motion will fail. That the record? No, I abstain. I don't know. I'm that. sorry. I thought you raised your hand. No. Awesome. What'd you say? I don't know that. No, I don't know that. <laughs> okay. Uh, I will call for another motion. I move, Mr. Chairman, we call a, 
a workshop meeting to discuss the issues and present uh, a vote after following that by no later than the next meeting. Uh, let me make sure I understand. Your, your motion is for the, cap, the, the planning commission and other related committees to schedule a workshop between now and our next planning commission. At that time, we will uh, readdress this and vote for it. On the issue. We have a motion to defer. We won't vote on it in the workshop. No, 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 no. no. It on we'll vote on it when it comes meeting. back here. We have a motion to defer for, until the next meeting. Do we have a second? I'll second that motion. We have a motion to second to defer to the next meeting. Ms. Weathers. 21st. Uh, would that be the 21st, Tom? 21st of April. 1, uh, one yeah. two, three. Yeah. I don't think that's right. Until the 21st of April. Just Jim. Question. With or without a moratorium? Uh, that is not part of the existing motion. No. So no, no protection for Tom's office. That's not part of the existing not motion. Part of the, not part of the vote. Okay. Uh, we have a motion to second. All those in favor of the vote. I have a point of discussion, Mr. Chairman. If, if we've already voted to not approve this, isn't that a recommendation to the county commission? No. Not at that point. We call for another motion. We have another motion. Uh, all those in favor of deferring for 30 days, please raise your right hand. We have seven uh, yeses. All those opposed? We have two. Uh, this will be brought uh, before the uh, April meeting of the West County Planning Commission again. And Tom, with uh, all due respect on the moratorium, uh, I'm certainly available to help you facilitate and organize whatever kind of workshop. Uh, I know this is being thrown on you. Uh, I'm more than willing to help you with whatever I can to facilitate that, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do we have anything else you need to talk about today, sir? No, sir. Okay. Uh, if that's the case, uh, we stand adjourned.